policy. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to our second panel, Big Law, Helping Clients Navigate a Rocky Post-Jobs Terrain. Our panelists today are Colleen Teresa Brown, Beth Brinkman, and Chris Hart. Colleen Teresa Brown is a partner in Sibley's privacy and cybersecurity practice in Washington, DC. Ms. Brown focuses on privacy, cybersecurity, data protection, and emerging technology for a variety of companies in the financial, telecommunications, media, retail, and manufacturing industries. At Sibley, Ms. Brown co-founded the Women in Privacy Networking Group and serves as the chief editor of the blog, Data Matters, Cybersecurity, Privacy, Data Protection, Internet Law, and Policy. Ms. Brown has been recognized as Cybersecurity Lawyer of the Year in Washington, D.C. by the Lawyer Network, listed as one of the world's leading female practitioners in privacy and data protection by Euromoney's Women in Business Law, and ranked as an up-and-coming privacy lawyer by Chambers. Ms. Brown received her BA from Loyola College and her JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Beth Brinkman is the co-chair of the Appellate and Supreme Court Litigation Group at Covington and Burling in Washington, DC. Ms. Brinkman is a leading national appellate litigator and has argued 26 cases before the United States Supreme Court. Before joining Covington, Ms. Brinkman served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Division of the United States Department of Justice, where she led the appellate staff during President Obama's administration. Ms. Brinkman has also led a Supreme Court and appellate practice at another national law firm, served as assistant to the Solicitor General, and worked as an assistant federal public defender. Ms. Brinkman received her JD from Yale Law School and her AB from the University of California, Berkeley. After law school, she served as a law clerk to Judge Phyllis A. Kravich of the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit and to Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman. Chris Hart is the co-chair of the Privacy and Data Security, Pro Data Security Practice at Foley Hoag in Boston. He is the leader in the firm's Cybersecurity Incident Response Team and Reproductive Health Practice Group. Mr. Hart is an experienced litigator and human rights lawyer with a focus on cybersecurity and global data protection. He has significant experience counseling clients on data privacy and cybersecurity, compliance, incident response, and government investigations. Mr. Hart is a member of the Boston Bar Association's Jobs Task Force and teaches as an adjunct professor at Northeastern University. Mr. Hart received his BA from Harvard University, his MA from St. John's College, and his JD from Duke University School of Law. Mr. Hart also served as a law clerk to Chief Judge Anthony J. Skarika on the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Please join me in giving our panelists a warm welcome. Okay, so I wanna start off by giving Chris Hart the um, credit for the idea for this panel. I spoke with Chris pretty quickly after Dobbs, um, also a Duke alum, just throwing out there, Duke alum. And when he was telling me the steps that his firm took in response to Dobbs, um, I was amazed, I was hopeful, I was like, wow. Um, and then I started talking to other people. And then I started hitting up my other friends. Um, and to say, you know, what about a conversation along these lines? Um, I think a lot of people who come to school, a school uh, like Duke and who come to law school at all uh, have to pay their bills. Uh, and, they, and maybe they are loving to go to a firm, and they've always wanted to go to a firm, but some people end up at a firm regardless. And some people would love to do work in this area. And I have to say I was amazed to learn that you can go to a big firm and do work in this area all day long. Um, I, I just, I can't even, we had our planning call for this uh, panel. First of all, these folks didn't need a planning call. That could have just been the panel. And here I was, the recipient of all of this information they were sharing with me, and I knew what I was getting into. I designed this for them to come and talk about this issue that I thought was very important. And by the end of the call, my head was literally spinning with the ways that these post-Dobbs laws are having ripple effects and consequences for the clients of these law firms, frankly, across the board. I was amazed. So in lieu of a, a narrative arc, basically what I've done in, in this panel is asked each of these folks to share with us 
uh, their answers to some of these questions. What actions each of their firms took in response to Dobbs, how they are personally participating in those responses, um, their perspectives on the major ways that post-Dobbs laws are affecting their practice and their clients, and specific aspects of the Dobbs decision itself that have really guided their risk analysis for their clients, and then to talk about, in addition, any privacy-specific issues, if you're a person that's going to go practice in the area of privacy and security in particular, how might this come across your plate? Um, but I think what we'll see is it's going to come across your plate, <laughs> whether you're practicing in the privacy area or not. Um, but so I'd love to, to invite you all to just kind of go through some of the remarks that you shared with me on our call. And um, we'll start with Chris and then Beth and Colleen, and then we'll open for um, more com conversation and questions. Well, Joanne, first of all, uh, thank you very much for organizing this. Thank you very much for letting me invite myself uh, to do. Uh, I, so, and I, and I actually had the chance to do so. The reason that, that you and I got connected is because I reached out to David Hoffman, and I, who I want to thank as well. And the reason that I reached out to David Hoffman is because I'll take any excuse to come back here. Uh, and I came back over the summer for the Cybersecurity Leadership Program mm -hmm. and got to meet uh, David and see the, the amazing work. And it really is amazing work that the law school uh, and the university as a whole is doing. Uh, in privacy and security. So thank you, David. Thank you, Jalen. And I'm very, very proud to share the stage with, with both of you. So thanks. Um, so um, I'm a partner at Foley Hoag. Uh, we're a law firm in Boston. We have, um, I don't know, 320 attorneys across five offices. Um, I'm a litigator, uh, and I co-chair our privacy and data security group. Um, after Dobbs came out, um, uh, I had a call with the chair of our uh, healthcare regulatory practice um, and a member of our white collar practice. And the call was essentially, what can we do about this and what do our clients need? And, and, and there are two distinct questions. Um, what can we do about this, right? In other words, what, what action can we take um, to try to um, solve the problem? Or problems, um, and that that I see as a uh, a question of, of moral direction, the way that the that we saw the impact of the decision. Um, but the other is, what do our clients need, um, and uh, what what is it that we can offer uh, to our clients to help them navigate this space? Uh, because from my perspective then, and my perspective now, um, is that the dominating feature of the uh, post Dobbs era as of February 2023 is uncertainty. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty about what is going to happen. Um, and what we recognized immediately was that a lot of clients were going to share our, um, our concerns about uh, that's this right, this well-established right that's been stripped away um, and, and how they can best help their employees, but also, uh, and, and their, whatever their views of what they can best do. Um, they needed some guidance and that we were well positioned to do so. So I coach our privacy practice. I'm a litigator. We have a healthcare regulatory practice. We have an FDA practice. Um, we have an international uh, law practice. Um, the list goes on. And none of us know, really any one of us, um, all of the areas of law that are touched by Dobbs. But there are many, many people at the law firm, when you put them together, um, they can collectively uh, help our clients. So the immediate question is, what does this look like? Is, is this a task force? Is this a practice group? Um, and, and we decided it was a practice group, which is, you know, is a commitment, right? Um, uh, I, there's, there's a lot, there was a lot of good reason to make this a task force because it is multidisciplinary. Um, it's not really any single area of law uh, in which you're practicing, um, but also because uh, uncertainty is also well, what is this going to mean in two years, right? It's not like having a litigation practice group where everybody's going to be litigating all the time forever. Um, so what does this actually look like? But we thought that it was important because it, the contrast was with our COVID task force. COVID was going to end someday. Well, it's really not going to end someday, but um, at least the, the acuteness of the pandemic was going to end, end someday. Dobbs was going to be permanent, at least for a long time, for a long time. And the landscape, the legal landscape, um, was going to 
slowly come into focus, but also change. And I think that we recognize that. And so we decided to make this a, a practice group. Um, and of course, there's, I won't bore you with the internal uh, firm bureaucracy, because it is boring, and there's a lot of it. Um, but, but we had it stood up in two weeks. And that is, I, I don't know what you would say for Sidley and Covington, that's a remarkable period of time <laughs> <laughs> to create a practice group and to advertise it and to have 20 lawyers in a meeting every week for a couple of months trying to figure out what we're going to do, who we're going to help, how we're, go how we're going to help. So that's, that was the idea behind it and, and how, how we got started. Um, we immediately uh, provided a lot of advice to a variety of different organizations. Um, and I have a long list. I'll, I'll forego the long list um, because I, I think it would be it'd be better for me to tell you the things that I was involved in. You know, and I'm, I'm involved as a privacy lawyer. There wasn't hasn't been too much for me to litigate yet. So I've been involved really providing privacy counsel. Um, and I will highlight three organizations. Um, and I will not name any of them for client confidentiality purposes. But one is a large private health insurer. Um, and the large private health insurer wanted to understand, okay, what if we get some kind of information request? And they're based in, in Boston. What if we get some kind of information request from the AG's office in Texas, from a private litigant? What if there is a criminal warrant for a provider? What do we do in response to those kinds of situations? We have no idea. We have no idea what the law is. We have no idea what our defenses are. Um, and they also made the interesting point that, look, you know, directionally, we don't want to give any of this information away in response. We want to be able to, to um, defend against any request for information. But we provide health insurers to employers who may be fine giving this information. And so we want to know what, what our options are, um, what, what the state of the law is. And so we wrote a very lengthy memo um, that provided uh, the state of the law and personal jurisdiction. It's a mess. I think maybe, maybe, maybe you already know that. Um, uh, personal jurisdiction, shield laws. Massachusetts has a shield law. The previous panel, which, by the way, thank you. That was a terrific panel. I learned a lot from the three of you. Um, uh, the shield, the Massachusetts has a shield law that provides some protection around um, uh, information requests and cooperation around uh, providing, um, say, for example, grand jury testimony or things like that. Um, uh, what, what does that have to say? What are your protections there? What are your protections under HIPAA? We know there are none. Oh, or <laughs> um, uh, what what other arguments can you can you make uh, to protect yourselves? Um, and what we learned in that process was that um, there are a, there's again a lot of uncertainty in the sense of a lot of these questions are untested. They're really they're they're not questions that are going to be easily answered until they're litigated or until they're challenged. Um, and, uh, and, but there are some arguments that can be made. Um, and, and here's your playbook for it. And that's what we've called it, is our, is our playbook. We did something very similar for a large civil rights organization that wanted to provide training to providers um, in Massachusetts uh, on what the state of the law was. And so we provided them a playbook um, around what arguments, what, what, they, what they should avoid doing, what, um, whether they should be worried about uh, being present in a, in a virtual telehealth session in Tennessee, uh, and whether w after they close the browser that they're going to be subject to extradition because they fled the jurisdiction, um, uh, for example. Um, and that was for a training for, for them to give to providers. And then there's a, another organization, um, and this is on a, a pro bono basis, um, that uh, provides assistance to victims of non-consensual pornography. And the question that they had was, do we have to worry about this? And, and they, you know, their concern, right, is that they're a 501c3 and they have to be really careful about um, losing that status if they make, um, uh, if, they, if they engage in political activity. And so, you know, what do we have to say about this? What can we say? And the discussion there was, well, is, is reproductive health information something that um, can be used to extort these same victims? And honestly, the, 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 the look on faces of the members of the board was, what are you talking about? Um, and you know, thinking about the, those kinds of consequences, and we ended up writing a playbook for them as well. So that you know, gives you a sense of the kind of advice that at least I've been involved in giving. We have employment lawyers who give advice on benefits and the impact of EMTALA. Um, uh, we have FDA uh, lawyers who are talking about the impact of executive orders or new regulations. Um, 
I will say this, and then I'll and then um, and then I'll stop talking. Um, the the thing that has been particularly interesting to me right now, although not necessarily surprising, um, is that a lot of what I'm talking about we were doing immediately after Dobbs. Um, and I would say that over the past few months, especially since the election, things have calmed down a bit from our clients' perspectives. And I think it's partly because. You know, at first, the uncertainty was, what do we do and how do we protect ourselves and how do we, how do we deal with these issues? But now it's wait and see. At least that's the sense I'm getting. You know, let's wait and see what happens. Let's wait and see um, if we need to do anything. There are some multi-jurisdictional or clients in, in multiple jurisdictions that don't necessarily want to poke their heads out um, on this issue. Um, there's, and, there's, and I'll leave you with this. The, the one thing that's become clear to a lot of organizations is that if they don't want to give information, they just shouldn't collect it. Or if they collect it, they should delete it if they can. I was on a panel. This is what I'll leave you with. I, was on a, I keep saying I'm going to leave you with something. Um, I was on a panel at the Boston Bar Association, um, and I was moderating the panel. And um, one of the panelists was um, an assistant attorney general who was largely responsible for writing the shield law in Massachusetts. And she whispered to me, she said, do you think I can just say, don't collect the data? I said, you absolutely should say, don't collect the data. And she said, if you don't want to, get, if you want to give the information, don't collect the data. Um, this whole idea of data minimization, of being careful about what you collect, who has it, how you delete it, that sort of thing. This is, these are basic privacy principles that have been around for 50 years. And what's amazing to me is that now, private organizations seem to be taking it seriously. Um, so. Well, um, thanks so much, Chris, and I'm so happy to be here, too. I just want to add to the thanks to both Joe Lynn and David. I've on, been on Team Joe Lynn for like 30 years. Um, <laughs> I saw her when she was not that far out of um, law school, and it's just been such a pleasure and exciting to watch her become such a um, leader and such a force in um, so many areas. Um, I also wanted to thank the students in a particular way. This is really the beginning of your legal career and stepping up, taking ownership, helping plan something like this, participating in these kinds of dialogues is really what you know becoming a practicing lawyer is about. And you know whether it's a specialization or just being aware of an area that's going to be adjacent to where you practice. So big kudos to you. And the other thing I want to say, this is a total pleasure for me to come and listen to this panel before me. I'm listening to my emails, emailing my clients, and it's so great to take a moment of pause and think about what deeper thinking folks are doing in this area and setting up, because that's really what law schools and academic writing does a lot of ways. They anticipate things that are coming and are looking for solutions. So I really appreciated the panel um, before us. I was going to focus on two different things. I want to follow up on what Chris was talking about a little bit about how at Covington and Berlin, where I'm a um, partner, you know, how we set up our response to this for our clients. And then I want to talk a little bit about the lay of the land on um, litigation and how that's developing in this area. Very much like Chris's explanation, this was a cross-practice response at Covington and Berlin. And frankly, the leak of the, you know, opinion gave us a lot of lead time. I actually have been working on issues related to this for a client um, because of SB 8. I had been called months even before the leak to talk about how to address some of these issues in light of the Texas statute that had been enacted allowing private lawsuits um, to challenge those who provide um, and receive abortions. So that was something that was already in the mix. We did not set up a particular practice group, but we really do practice across um, different groups all of the time, and so we came together in a more formal way. And it was initiated in a lot of ways by clients coming to us, and I'd say one of the first funnels where that came from was from all of our clients as employers, because employers are the people who provide health insurance, <laughs> right? That's how our system is set up. And I had employers across the spectrum, across all the industries you can imagine. I had employers that were politically outraged about this and wanted to do something. I had you know, clients who were saying, like, we've never thought of this issue. We've never taken a position on this issue. We have no interest in taking a position on the issue. But we really care about the privacy of our employees. And we also care about our employees who don't agree with this. I mean, many employers had to go back and look at their own insurance policies. I don't know. What, what do we cover? Um, particularly with the travel benefit, 
There were travel benefits pre-existing having to do with if you needed particular kinds of cancer treatment that wasn't um, you know, available within a certain radius of where you worked. So that was um, a lot of competing interests for employers. And one of the um, terms that Jolene used that's so important as a real practicing litigator or advisor out there in the real world is risk analysis. Because what you're, you can't give them yes or no answers to these things. So your clients have to determine what the risk is. And one of the questions came up like, who has this data? And is the data we have, does it just say they're getting you know, OBGYN care or reproductive care? Like what detail of data do we have? And why do we have this? <laughs> so, um, and trying to figure out um, where that was going forward. So I think it's driven employers to look at many things um, that they had not looked at before. Um, in addition, we have a couple of different privacy practices. I think unlike um, Chris and Colleen, I do appellate and Supreme Court work. I do regulatory work. I sue the government. I know a lot about FDA and regulations. I don't do that much data privacy work, but I work with my colleagues who did. And so we have our data privacy folks and the people who advise mainly tech clients, but a lot of clients about law enforcement efforts and subpoenas and data. But then we have, we do a lot of um, government-facing litigation involving pharmaceuticals at Covington. You know, we have, since the FDA was created, you know, we're a very classic DC firm in that way. So we have, you know, our HIPAA team and our FDA regulatory team. So all of us came together, and when a client comes in, we would say, you know, give the answer maybe about employment, and, you know, you need to talk to our employee benefits folks about ERISA. There's an ERISA preemption argument. Federal law of ERISA may preempt a lot of um, the restrictions in the employment um, insurance area, but that depends upon what kind of health insurance plan you have at your company. And the people I'm usually talking to, they don't know. They have to go talk to their employee benefits people. So when you think about a client as a, and these are nonprofits also. You know, they're for business corporations. They're nonprofits. And they're having to talk within their own entity. So sometimes your advice to your client is, this is the information you need to go find out from other people in your organization. The um, next topic I wanted to talk to was really about how we're keeping on top of this and what the development is in litigation to kind of follow as the second chapter of what you heard on the first panel. So we've been you know, monitoring all of this for our clients. Some of them want weekly updates. Some of them want monthly updates. You know, we have regular calls with some of them because many of our clients operate in several states. You know, the, the best thing, like the, the, my theme for kind of client advice, the most important thing to most clients is one role and stability. <laughs> they don't have one role. They have 50 roles. And even those 50 rules are completely changing. This is a nightmare for anyone who just wants to you know, run a nonprofit, run, run a business, and take care of their employees. So when um, we've been trying to keep them on top of all of this, it, it's been interesting. We, we tell them about the statutes. And of course, here, there are statutes that were from before Roe, that were after Roe between Dobbs, that were triggered by Dobbs. There are a couple new statutes like Indiana enacted after Dobbs. And then there are the different kinds of statutes, like that Texas statute, SB 8, I mentioned, where they let individuals sue. That was a particular concern when um, Dobbs first came out. And there was an expectation that there was going to be a wave of similar state statutes. As of now, really only Oklahoma has that kind of similar statute, although we know that there are other states that would. And one of the um, kind of uh, frameworks I think that's important to understand about why that's a different kind of concern is not just because you might have individuals who just want to get money from that kind of suit, but it's what, you know, Stephanie was talking about prosecutors and their discretion and how they decide who to charge with a crime. And in Oklahoma, for example, the attorney general issued a, you know, statement explaining that the, for, the law enforcement officers should deprioritize, not focus on prosecuting women, you know, focus on kind of bigger offenders, that type of thing. There is no restriction like that on individuals bringing lawsuits. So I do think, and I, I spent more than 15 years of my career at the Department of Justice, but I was also a public defender. I've seen both sides of criminal prosecutions. I do think that the government actually serves as a guardrail 
on who gets prosecuted and who goes after, maybe different states differently, but there's no kind of restriction like that on private lawsuits. So the fact that those lawsuits, that those new statutes did not come to the fore was um, very interesting. So then after, you know, we advise clients about all the statutes and all, then it's all about, well, then come the lawsuits and where that litigation is going. So we've been following the um, lawsuits that are being brought primarily under state constitutions. And the day that we had our pre-call um, was quite momentous because on the one hand, South Carolina, the Supreme Court said that the South Carolina Constitution protected the right to abortion. And then immediately thereafter, the Idaho Supreme Court said the Idaho state constitution does not protect abortion. The interesting thing about these cases and their implication for um, privacy makes me just want to focus for just a couple minutes on the two opinions. Um, a big headline I want to say is they were both three to two. One vote in those days. I mean, that was surprising to me. It also might be interesting for you to know how the ju judges on those courts are selected. <laughs> I'm Google. I'm, I'm Wikipedia, <laughs> like Googling. South Carolina, the members of the Supreme Court are chosen by the General Assembly. Because you're wondering what um, a justice is choosing to, you know, lay their job out. Maybe you know, are they going to be in there in the next term? In Idaho, um, they're elected by, they can be appointed by the governor, but then they have retention elections and they're elected to a certain term. So three to two in both instances. That certainly means that there's a lot of power out there for change on state um, Supreme Courts one way or the other. The big difference in the cases is, I, in my opinion, the South Carolina Constitution has an explicit reference to privacy. And that's where they hung their hat on it. So this is important, not just for reproductive rights, but it's for all kinds of interests in privacy. Um, and that, I think, is going to be a consequence of the post dobbs landscape. There are going to be state developments and privacy law that go far beyond just reproductive rights. So um, the South Carolina opinion really talked about the language that um, prohibits an unreasonable invasion of privacy. The explicit text was the main hook. And that um, there were, uh, everybody felt compelled to write. There were two concurrences. And then there were two dissents. And one of the dissents said, yes, there is privacy. It just doesn't perfect the right to abortion. But another one of the dissents said, really, the privacy is only about search and seizure of the Fourth Amendment. You know, because they all have different, there's an inalienable rights provision in some of these state statutes, search and seizure provision. So there you have different justices in the Supreme Court saying, yes, broad privacy, narrow privacy, privacy only having to do with law enforcement. In Idaho, um, there were various opinions also. Um, they have an inalienable right clause, which is life, liberty, and the protection of property. There is no explicit reference in privacy in the Idaho um, Constitution. And the arguments there had been about whether or not there's a right to autonomy, privacy, intimate family decisions under the Idaho Constitution. Interestingly, the majority said, regardless of whether those exist, there's no right to abortion. So there was a state Supreme Court saying, we're not engaging in all of this um, general uh, development of law about privacy. We're going to be really focusing on abortion here. And it went through these provisions, and it said the search and seizure provision, you know, the analog to the Fourth Amendment, isn't a source of substantive rights at all. Um, there was a um, provision in there like the Ninth Amendment that rights are left to the, the, to the people, and they said that isn't a source of um, rights either, just pre-existing. And then they went to the individual rights, the due process, and followed a analysis that's very much like Dobbs, that it wasn't deeply rooted in the history or traditions of Idaho. Um, but there were two dissents there also. Um, one of the dissents really focused on the um, inalienable rights and had a, a focus on that this was an inalienable right for women to um, health and safety in, in their life. And was quite strong on that. But then another uh, member of the court went and said, um, that he would adopt an even broader view of privacy. Um, I have to say, you know, a 3-2 vote from South Carolina and Idaho with, you know, half a dozen opinions, that's a lot of law to be developed on privacy that's just coming out of Dobbs. Um, 
The other thing I want to say is about implications of this, not just in the development of privacy for reproductive rights, but other areas that are um, really going to be at the fore in some of this. And Carly already mentioned one of these, um, LGBTQ rights, uh, health care for uh, transgender, but other members of um, the community. I would mention in vitro fertilization. That is something that isn't mentioned and yet um, is implicated by some of the analysis. And the other thing is birth control. And when I say that to anyone, you know, of a younger generation, they just look at me like, oh, come on. Well, I would just want to say a couple things. One, Roe was decided in 1973, Roe versus Wade. It was only in 1972 that the Supreme Court held that unmarried people have a right to birth control. 72. So I think, you know, take a breath there. Um, a really positive development came out of the Food and Drug Administration um, in December. And that was to clarify that emergency contraceptive plan B one step is not an abortifacient. The labels before that were quite unclear. And it comes back to kind of a, a science issue I'll mention in, in, in one last comment. But those are a lot of areas that aren't directly um, reproductive rights. I mean, obviously, birth control is, but IVF, LGBTQ rights, not to mention all kinds of aspects of the data privacy that goes along with those that the um, panel spoke about earlier. So the last thing I, I wanted to mention just in this opening is two areas that I think are so profoundly at issue in this new era of privacy law. One is science and history. Science, well, talk about inconsistent state laws. These laws are just so inconsistent. You can go to a state and see three different statutes that are inconsistent about when pregnancy begins. So does pregnancy begin at conception? Or is there just potential life at conception? Is it, um, you know, at fertilization? That I'm, or is it at implantation? implantation into the womb, and frankly, implantation was the historic understanding of when pregnancy really began. So some statutes refer to pregnancy, some refer to fertilization, sometimes they inconsistently refer to each other. Um, and a lot of these statutes, like a topic pregnancy was brought up before, how those are even understood to be pregnancy within the meaning of the term pregnancy. And you know, the cross references, you have one state statute, you have to go in another section of the code, not even the same code to find out what the definition of pregnancy is. So when you do that, you know that whoever wrote this part wasn't really thinking of that part. So um, I think the science of what pregnancy means. And actually, I thought the uh, majority opinion in the South Carolina Supreme Court did a nice job on some of this. Um, the other thing is history. Um, we've all read the majority opinion in Dobbs that has so much to do with history. Well, I just want to put that against the backdrop of broader constitutional doctrine. We all knew for the past several years that the you know, uh, Second Amendment, the right to firearm, that is really been focused on history for many years in the Supreme Court, original intent, going back to what the right to bear arms means. Well, last term, the Supreme Court also took a big, you know, turn towards history in the religion clauses. They got rid of the lemon test, and now they're looking to, like, what the history is, what's deeply rooted at the time of the Constitution. You know, I've talked to intermediate court of appeals judges who are wondering, how are we supposed to be experts in history or science for that matter? I think science comes up in the LGBTQ area also. So the um, judges are really kind of wondering, you know, what they're going to do about this. And um, it's a, troubling, I think, because of course, I'll just close on this. When I read the Idaho, South Carolina opinions, and of course Dobbs, you know, as a woman, now, I'm a white woman. I can only imagine what is a person of color and a woman reading about what the Constitution meant when it was an act. I'm thinking, okay, hmm, I couldn't vote then. I couldn't own property then. Like, whose property is that? It's not my property they're talking about. So it really is a fundamental issue. Not to say I don't think that, you know, tradition, a text, certainly um, I think it has a lot more to do with statutory interpretation than constitutions who are writ written in a broader way. But when you're looking at the history and deeply rooted in the histories and traditions. So um, 
the South Carolina Supreme Court majority opinion is really good on this. And I, I suggest you read that. There's this whole state history about their constitution. I think it's the West Commission. There's this back and forth debate. And um, the, chief, the justice who wrote that is a woman. And she said, you know, that's ridiculous. You know, women weren't even a part of that. Why are we looking to that? So that's a much broader context, I think, about privacy, about privacy, not just in reproductive rights, and also how this may or may not affect data privacy and whether or not that's going to be viewed more in this search and seizure way under these state constitutions. So, you know, it's great in private practice to be able to um, do this. It's really serving our clients, answering their um, issues and their risk analysis about um, how they can go forward, whether it's their employee health insurance or their data privacy policies and, you know, how that um, in, uh, affects their business operations. All right. Well, hi, everybody, and thank you again for inviting me. I, I want to make a little note. Um, I am a private uh, practitioner, and I have lots of clients in a lot of industries. Um, my comments today don't necessarily reflect the views of my clients. Um, and I have been working with a lot of clients uh, post-Dobbs, and Sidley's response was uh, fairly typical of, of Sidley's response to any new um, legal question uh, facing society, which is to pull all of our fabulous, um, uh, you know, talent together from a variety of different perspectives, because this is a multidisciplinary problem. Um, the, the task force that, uh, that was put together at Sidley, I am the privacy, uh, um, I am the privacy attorney on it, but we have folks from literally every practice group. I believe the only exception is tax. <laughs> um, and, and why? It's because this is impacting so many of our clients. Uh, before I get into how it's impacting them, I want to note, um, just, just piggybacking on what, what Beth said, you know, Dobbs is a constitutional privacy decision. And the history of privacy, there are many, you know, what is privacy? A very interesting question. There's a lot of different ways to look at privacy. And um, two of the ways to look at it that are fairly uh, popular uh, to understand is, is decisional autonomy and informational autonomy. And the majority opinion in Dobbs went to great pains to say that they were not disrupting informational autonomy with this decision. However, it is a slippery slope because they are interrelated. Um, informational privacy is about your uh, ability to control your information uh, in, in, in to an ends of, of preventing you know, the unwanted gaze so that you have the freedom to make decisions. And so these are really um, you know, secular, circular and, and connected concepts. Also, the right to privacy uh, in, in the Constitution, it's vis-a-vis -vis the government. And I'm a private practitioner. My clients are not the government. So um, how could it really impact me? Well, the fact of the matter is data and informational autonomy that impacts decisional autonomy is largely in the hands of the private sector. The private sector participates in the information economy, the digital economy the digital exhaust of our lives that has only escalated over the last decade, two decades. And our clients uh, saw this coming, and they had a lot of questions. And they knew they were going to be impacted from a variety of ways. And what they come to their trusted partners, their, their counsel for, is help with the fundamental issue for a business, which is risk management, to piggyback off of another uh, of Beth's themes. Companies have to manage risk. And to manage risk, they have to articulate and understand the risk. And in a world where everything is vague and ambiguous and could potentially carry not just civil penalties, but criminal penalties and reputational risk, it is very hard to manage your risk, to uh, call back to the first panel, to figure out what are the trade-offs here. Even looking through the trade-offs, um, a lot of them are certainly not obvious. And one of the great pleasures of practicing in this era, dealing with this uh, earthquake, was learning every day the new trade-offs and the implications, frankly, surprising me every day. 
Um, and one thing I want to say also is, is especially for the law students there, um, lawyers are great when they stay curious because you can continually learn. Um, uh, you think you know, uh, you know, HIPAA. I'm a privacy lawyer. I know, I know HIPAA. Um, you know, how many different ways there are, uh, I don't want to call them necessarily loopholes, but openings for data to be shared in this context, for example. thought I knew a HIPAA cold. I didn't realize, you know, how much it was ineffective here. I mean, I knew it was going to be ineffective here, but oh, man, it's really ineffective. And then when you have, you know, the government issuing essentially assurances that are potentially misleading. Um, you know, figuring out how to articulate to that client, to those clients that are impacted, trying to manage risk, that this guidance that just came out from HHS, um, you know, is not going to save you. The Fourth Amendment's not going to save you um, when you have this data. And, and to Chris's point, data minimization has been, for a privacy lawyer, for me, uh, you know, one of the mantras. How do you manage risk here? It is about your data. And, um, and there's a lot that can be done, and there's a lot more that needs to be done. And I do agree that companies have gotten even more serious about it now, post Dobbs, examining what data they have. But the problem is, you can't not collect all of this data. A lot of times, you will have it no matter what, because it's the nature of your business. And in this world of supercomputers and AI and inferences, um, I think people really woke up to the fact of how much data they have that might at first seem innocuous that could reveal pregnancy status. What could be of interest to a prosecutor? Um, and it was really eye-opening. And, and for many, many companies, there's not so much they can do about it because they're going to have to have the data. Um, but that's not going to necessarily save them from the variety of legal risks that are coming down on them. So uh, just as a couple um, examples, you know, we haven't yet seen a lot of the cases where a company has to challenge the subpoena and wrestle with the full faith and credit clause. Um, but we have started to see privacy enforcement. And in particular, the FTC is at the forefront of this. Some of you, if you follow privacy law, might have been watching the Kuchava case with the FTC. What is the FTC really concerned about? Well, they're concerned about geolocation information. And Kuchava uh, essentially is, is kind of like a data broker. They, they collect a lot of data. They make it available. And some of the information they have uh, relates to location information. And although not the only driving concern, the FTC has made clear that one of the risks here and one of the reasons they're looking at it through a UDAP framework is that location information can reveal certain things about your health status. Um, and they want to incentivize companies to minimize that data and really scrutinize when they have data that could be sensitive. Uh, just uh, this week, there was also another FTC settlement came down $1.5 million with GoodRx. And it was an enforcement relating to the collection of health information through pixels um, and also impacted, uh, was it, it, it implicated the FTC's breach notification rule. Um, so this is data not necessarily subject to HIPAA, but there is a lot of health privacy law out there. And there's a lot of ways that people are really examining now how information was being collected with traditional, typical digital website practices that people didn't realize was getting collected. And then when you aggregate it, what picture does it present? Now, a lot of people may think that this massive amount of data doesn't present as much privacy concern because it's a massive amount of data. There's a lot of noise there, and it's aggregated. But the fact of the matter is the more data you have, the greater risk there is of re-identifying that data by information that's available, including for law enforcement that can buy it from the private sector. And we haven't really solved those risks yet. So, you know, my, my colleagues and I, uh, I have yet to be on a call with a client by myself on Dobbs issues because they are so interdisciplinary. I always have at least one other partner in a completely different practice group, and we're working together to think about these issues. 
Um, I'll just throw out some. So employee, employee benefits, immediate, immediate. That was the first wave of, oh my gosh, what are we going to do for our employees and our insurance policies? What do they cover? Um, insurance coverage, reimbursement for certain drugs, labeling issues, telemedicine issues, um, subpoena issues, um, communications privacy issues, encryption, uh, uh, again, also tied to subpoena concerns. Um, just a lot of constitutional stuff. Oh, dormant commerce clause coming at me again. <laughs> Where did that come from? So many fabulously interesting issues that required a lot of different expertise brought to bear um, on this. M&A was impacted. I had several deals come to a screeching halt as people tried to figure out the risk and value the risk of the impact of this decision on a company they were about to invest in. Um, maybe the tax lawyers may be the only ones who were not really impacted. Yeah. And you know what? I probably am just, I, I, they probably were. They were probably or somehow. They or they were. <laughs> um, so it's a really complex um, issue. Uh, in my cyber side of my hat, I'm, I'm also a cybersecurity lawyer, and there's a, a great concern about what data is available, um, f you know, that hacktivists might be interested in. Um, and, you know, the going back to the potential for blackmail, um, you know, going back again to informational autonomy and how informational autonomy, um, you know, has been impacted tremendously by this. And so many players are, are participating in it. So um, I think, uh, you know, I think I've covered a lot of what we've been doing on it, uh, but I will say there's so much more. And I have, and, and, I have no doubt that we will continue. I mean, it was a good idea to put it as a practice group because there's some job security here. <laughs> there's so much risk and so much uncertainty, and the uncertainty drives the risk, that there's going to be questions on this for lawyers to figure out and partner with their clients for, for frankly, years to come, years, years, uh, and years to come. Um, and it's fun too. Uh, and, and, and you know, you go to law school to problem solve for, for many of us. We go to law school to problem solve. And it's frustrating when uh, problems can't be solved. Um, but being creative, being curious, uh, and partnering with your clients to work through these issues is one of the great joys of private practice. Um, See what I mean? Like, wow, mergers and acquisitions, really? That's going to affect mergers and acquisitions? So amazing. Thank you all for those opening comments. And um, one of the things that I wanted to draw attention to is this different, how this is different in every state. So you guys mentioned, right, we have the 13 states that are banning. We've got it, it, half of these states that are dealing with this. It's in some form of court um, d d struggle. Uh, so... Among the states that have laws banning abortion, they're all different, right? They're all different. And I just want to analogize to our situation of data privacy in the United States. We do not have a federal comprehensive privacy law. We have a number of states, California, Colorado, Utah, Connecticut, uh, Virginia, that have passed their own laws, and those laws are all different. And so people, uh, industry has been jumping on the bandwagon lately, right, to say, oh, we need federal comprehensive regulation. Mainly they just want one rule, and frankly, they don't always want it to be a great rule um, to protect consumers. But now we're seeing this parallel situation with abortion and all of these different rules in different states. And from the first panel, we're talking about the rights of women and individuals being different in different states, and states then reaching out and trying to create laws that govern the behavior of their citizens when they're not in their own state. So when we were reading the Dobbs opinion in the Dobbs and privacy and surveillance class last semester, um, one of my students said, so what's the point of Kavanaugh's opinion? Uh, why is that there? Um, obviously, we know what the majority is saying. And then we got Thomas, you know, substantive due process, yeah, let's just throw the whole thing out. Um, but Kavanaugh, what did it add? Why is it there? And Beth, I think you have a theory mm -hmm. on why that Kavanaugh opinion is there. And so I just wanted to see if you want to just mention that and how you think that's going to affect this whole state-to-state -state thing. 
Sure. Um, I think one of the most significant sentences for my clients that came out of the Dobbs opinion was in the concurring opinion by Justice Kavanaugh, where he noted that, you know, he supported the constitutional right to interstate travel. That was very important because the certainty of that non-explicit constitutional right is one that could have been up for grabs. There's a lot up for grabs as, you know, constitutional law evolves, but particularly at this moment. And, um, you know, some theories are that Justice Kavanaugh wrote that because of the dissent and the, the, the dissent kind of explaining all the problems that are, are going to come from Dobbs. Um, whatever the reason that Justice Kavanaugh did that, I think it sent an incredible signal to lower court judges. Um, no one can be sure how the Supreme Court would vote. Um, we have a new member now. The Chief Justice did not join Justice Kavanaugh separate opinion. He wrote separately. But I think there's a certain feeling of confidence that there would be five votes to uphold the constitutional right to travel. If that sentence had not been in there, I think our discussions with our clients would have been even more uncertain. The other thing you have to um, kind of be aware of, many of you might already be aware of this, there's a case at the Supreme Court now having to do with pigs and pork that could have a big impact on this. Um, there was a case that was already up at the court about the Pork Producers Council and um, I forget, Proposition 12, I think, in California. So California has a law, I'll kind of oversimplify here, that says if you're going to be selling pork in California, the sows um, have to have been given a larger pen and certain kind of um, health. They have to be raised in a particular way. And that purports to apply to hog farmers in Iowa. And there's a debate about, again, amongst veterinarians about what, you know, the science is on this. But the extraterritorial reach of that state law is very interesting. And this is not lost on any member of the Supreme Court. I mean, nobody was talking about reproductive rights during the argument, but everyone was thinking about reproductive rights during the argument. And it also shows how the development of constitutional law, in my opinion, is served by when it's looked at in multiple non-political or less political situations. Um, you know, we don't want to have a reproductive rights exception to, you know, whatever. And so you have to look at that and what is our federalism and, and how do these state laws um, interact and how can they go beyond the territory? How can they have an estate, an effect beyond um, their territory? And what does that mean? Uh, you know, these aiding and abetting provisions that, you know, what is conduct within the state? What is conduct outside the state? Um, actually, like a Colleen, I should say, this, you know, reflects my own view. I did do an amicus brief in that case for a retail association. They were really worried just because they have huge supply chains. I mean, forget everything about, you know, treatment of animals or abortion. Just, you know, to have your laptop sold and you know, the number of um, suppliers through their chain and what if there were laws, and there are laws in some states, and, you know, positive policies, I'm sure, about child labor or environmental issues or, or union um, shops. How does that affect our interstate commerce? And how can entities comply with that? And do they have to make every, everybody in their supply chain comply with that? And what if somebody you know, doesn't comply? So that, again, is a way in which I think Dobbs, data, implications across states are really going to have an impact in other areas and how cases in other areas are going to impact here. Um, because that interstate right to travel that Justice Kavanaugh mentioned, of course, doesn't just, you know, it doesn't just apply to patients, of course, it applies to providers. You know, medical professionals have been, you know, concerned about this, certainly. Um, insurance providers, you know, medical um, hospitals, I mean, there's just a lot at issue there but it's not limited to this area, of course. And so Chris, you mentioned, and actually each of you mentioned on our call, and I think even here today, the increased interest in data minimization. Mm -hmm. And you know, we saw that it took California passing a comprehensive state privacy law to get industry 
to start be getting on board with a federal law, right? The last thing industry wants is 50 different laws that have to do with privacy. Um, now that your clients are seeing these holes in our data protection system and their risks and vulnerabilities associated with having this data, as opposed to just benefit, how can I use this data down the road? Do you think that commercial entities are going to be more receptive to the idea of federal privacy legislation that has collection limitations and data minimization rules? I'm thinking about something that Colleen said um, in her comments, and that's that um, businesses still have to do their business. Right? Mm -hmm. They still, and um, somebody, I forget who, used the term data economy earlier, and that's, and, and I do think, uh, the reason I hesitate is that I think yes and no. Yes, in the sense that um, I think there's an awareness of how um, difficult it can be to protect employees um, from information requests, given the state of the law and given how much information they collect. So I think that, that th there's been an awareness raising. But um, following up on, on comments I ended with, um, it, when it doesn't feel like an emergency anymore, when it now feels like the status quo, then it's a lot easier to continue doing your business. All of which is to say that I think that um, it's been salutary in the data minimization, and actually in one other respect that I didn't mention, and actually businesses knowing what data they have, it's actually remarkable remarkable how much organizations do not actually appreciate and understand how much data they have, mm -hmm. how long they have it, who has it, et cetera. Um, it's usually shocking. Um, so that's been salutary. But I, but my sense of it is that, you know, we're, we're at a point right now where it's much more of the status quo. And, and the, it's what I'll call kind of the ordinary give and take. It's um, how do we do our business? Um, how do we um, what, what do we do with regard to the evolution of privacy law? Um, how do we protect our employees? Yes, but you know we also need to do our business. And the, the question about AI is very interesting, um, Colleen. The, the Colleen raised because um, that that is now a ubiquitous technology uh, or series of technologies. Right? Who came here to find AI? No. Mm -hmm. um, and but it requires an enormous amount of data. Um, uh, and uh, and and that that data sort of you know exists sort of forever, right? Because you're sort of constantly training on it. And so I've had conversations with clients where I've talked about this concept of data minimization, and how that's that's going to be a, a more increasingly codified uh, area of, of privacy law. But then I get a lot of this pushback, um, and even in conversations about minimization having to do with protecting employees, there's still this question of well, we need X data. We have to maintain Y data, um, so so I do think I do think it's a much more fraught um, issue, um, uh, even though I think there's an increasing awareness of the dangers of, of uh, collecting and maintaining um, large swaths of potentially very sensitive information. Interesting, interesting. And and Colleen, I was so happy to hear you call out that majority opinion on their distinction between decisional privacy and information privacy. And I think it was in their discussion of looking back at Roe and, and the case saying, well, the only, the only cases that, that could possibly be implicated here are the decisional privacy cases. And I'm like, uh, no, you are so wrong. I'm a, no, you are so, what, who taught your privacy class? Um, that's what I wanted to say. And so I'm wondering if you're seeing in your practice, um, because we see this relationship between decisional privacy and information privacy in this context, but also increasingly in the data space and how our data is used in ways that mm -hmm. preclude us from making fully autonomous decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm wondering if you're seeing more of a, an understanding of the relationship between information privacy and decisional privacy in other parts of your... Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I say this frequently, Privacy is a freedom right. Privacy gives freedom. And the, uh, the realization that data that other entities may have about you that they would use for a business purpose could potentially manipulate the consumer is something that really is a hot button um, and I think much better understood issue today. 
and it's called dark patterns. This is something that the FTC is very interested in in its advance notice of proposed rulemaking from the fall. The FTC is thinking about issuing pretty massive earthquaking, you know, shaking uh, privacy uh, uh, regulations. And one of the things they're interested in is dark patterns. Now, dark patterns are any potentially deceptive or manipulative um, uh, design choices that may essentially urge consumers one way or the other. And, you know, for people who have done business or been in the marketing world, they're like, yeah, marketing, marketing. Uh, that, yeah, we're, we're trying to urge our people to, you know, um, you know buy this product, um, look at this instead of that you know, uh, resubscribe, that is kind of, there's a history uh, of, of marketing. It's very hard to tell the distinction between traditional business practices and dark patterns that um, potentially already could be uh, enforced against through existing law, unfair and deceptive acts and practices authorities. Um, but we're trying to tease out what's the distinction, what really is a dark pattern, what is harmful, but at the end of the day, it's this concern about are we being manipulated? And are we being manipulated more today than we ever were and why? And is it because of our technologies? And is it because of the information powering our technologies? Uh, and that's a privacy law cutting edge issue. And again, why? It's about freedom. Uh, it's also a little bit tinged with antitrust. I'm married to an antitrust lawyer, so we have a lot of debates uh, you know, at home about this. But these issues are related. Uh, data uh, can power consumer choice. Data issues are now being considered in, in antitrust law very closely. Um, and at a global level, we're in this big conversation, frankly, led by the EU. The US should be leading more on this, but right now it's being led by the EU, about digital services regulation going to, again, speaking of earthquakes in the law and how we're going to do business, the digital services uh, regulation that's coming from Europe is trying to also figure out, you know, how much data is too much data and what rights do people have? Are there shared ownership rights? You know, what um, custodial-like responsibilities do you have with regard to data and when you provide certain kinds of services that involve technologies? And it's because this issue of these technologies and this information that's out there at a certain level, um, you know, does it impact people's behavior in problematic ways, in ways that we should be regulating? Does it take away our freedom? And it's a real cutting edge issue. Yeah, and so a lot of those user design interfaces also are they are prompting the sharing of information. They want you to pick the, the, the version of whatever it is, the app, that shares more information. Um, so uh, sometimes, you know, uh, Flow, I think, Flow, uh, the app, uh, the period tracker app, added an anonymous uh, version of the app in response, I think, to a lot of this. But it is super, super, super hard to find. And if you use that aspect of it, the anonymous part, a lot of the functions don't work. But but we're just being pushed in ways to share more and more information online that can be used to make decisions about us. And in the context, as we discussed on the first panel, of having our mobile devices or data that is shared with third parties available to law enforcement in states that are criminalizing abortion, putting people even more at risk for sharing that information. Um, I'd love to open it up to you guys um, to have some questions about practicing privacy in a law firm and how privacy and security uh, are coming into play with these new laws criminalizing abortion. Um, anybody would like to, to start off? Questions from the audience? Yes, Alvin. Uh, so I have three questions. <laughs> Yes. 
I'll, I'll, I'll give a, I'll give a, a more fulsome answer. Thank you for calling me Professor Hart. It's, I, I wish that, I wish that was the case. Um, so, um, the, I, I, I've represented clients who have been very interested in creating um, codes of conduct around AI. Uh, where else is Europe leading? They're leading in AI regulations. Not, not, not a lot going on in the US, um, although we could have a conversation about that. So, so it's really, there's a lot of freedom to, um, to develop um, AI systems, AI technology, they'll use that very broadly. Uh, but but there, are, there are a number of organizations that I've talked to that are very concerned about making sure that they are doing what? That they're um, uh, finding and weeding out and preventing bias. Um, that they're um, not collecting information that they don't actually need to collect. Um, and so they, they want to have some kind of internal guardrail to do that. The, the problem with that is, at least in my experience, and, and maybe, maybe you have some thoughts about this, um, anybody here, um, the, the problem with that is that um, it, it's very hard to exclude specific data um, if, if you're trying to create um, a, a broad-based decision-making kind of or predictive kind of, of system, right? So, for example, um, outside of the Dobbs context, uh, uh, one, one question is what about uh, collecting um, racial data or demographic data or income data, right? I mean, this is all potentially sensitive information. It's, it's information that could lead to um, uh, problematic um, outputs. Um, but it's hard to, to create a bright line because you can imagine ways in which that kind of information can actually um, help prevent the very bias that um, that that you're you're trying to uh, to not create. So, um, so what ends up happening um, in my experience is that organizations that are really serious about this issue set up uh, guardrails that include things like um, testing models. Um, uh, that include auditing outputs, that include uh, pretty broad-based governance around um, the coding, the inputs, and the outputs. And so, um, so the answer is, is yes, there, there could be a tension, right, if there's certain kind of information. Like the, the, the obvious, an obvious piece of information that sort of cuts across might be geolocation data, okay? Um, yes, it can create uh, a, a lot of difficulties if you're trying to minimize what you're collecting and using. Um, but I think it can be very difficult for organizations, we're speaking in the abstract, for organizations to completely exclude entire categories of data and have um, successful tools that they can use. I don't know if I, yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to echo something. I want to ding, 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 ding on a word that he just used governance. Information governance is the, is one of, possibly the most important key here for companies to manage risk. And I'm also going to ding, ding, ding on another thing that, that he said, which was companies often don't know what they have. You can't govern what you don't know. And so these are foundational programmatic issues. Um, you need visibility into your data. You need to figure out why you want the data, what you want to do with it, who you're sharing it with how long you're holding on to it, and how you're keeping it secure. And then you need to think critically about the choices you're making uh, with respect to each of those things and have governance in, in, you know, set up for that. What does that mean? It means, you know, one person doesn't make these decisions. Uh, it means collecting information from across the organization and bringing them together. It, it means checks and balances within an organization. And so, um, does a day go by where you don't say the word governance in your practice? Yeah, <laughs> governance, data governance, so important right now, but it can't mitigate all risk. Uh, Stephanie? <laughs> <laughs> well, start with the premise that the government is always consistent in positions. Yeah. <laughs> um, one can 
can't proceed that way. Um, and, and Beth, who was in the Solicitor General's office and was lobbied all the time by different parts of the government that had different equity. Um, so, you know, it's a very, it's a very hard thing to resolve. I mean, I, I see this happening now in the way that the government is trying to regulate um, spyware and, and foreign, com foreign companies who are developing very uh, intrusive spyware tools, yet we don't always talk about, you know, what we may be doing. Um, so there are these conflicts. How to resolve them is, boy, if I had the answer to, to that question, um, in theory, Congress is supposed to help me now. <laughs> but I, I will always hold my breath. You know, can I say really quickly as an aside, what, one of the places where I've seen this come up um, is in biometrics, right? So, so where, so right now in Massachusetts, um, there's there's been a, a proposed law um, uh, setting guardrails around the collection and use of face surveillance data by um, law enforcement, uh, and it's very interesting. And I presented to the Boston Bar Association's counsel on this question, and one of the questions I got was. What about private organizations? Is there any ban for them? And I said no. Um, and and then the, so right so there's this this you know the tensions in many ways go both ways right. So um, uh, why is it that we're focusing on the collection or lack of collection for private entities versus public entities in in any uh, set of categories? And there are really complex reasons for that. But and the most important for my mind though is the power of the state. And in the United States, we really do make a judgment call that it's reasonable to fear the power of the state more than the power of the market. Um, not every country makes that judgment call between what's more concerning. But Dobbs illustrates why the power of the state is so concerning with regard to privacy. Um, yeah. I'm ding, ding, dinging that <laughs> for sure. Um, any other questions you want to have? Yes. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I found really interesting that you all talked about when you write the novel, and I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts on, and I think it was um, the Women's Policing Office that received a footnote um, saying some certain members of the Tech Security Caucus saying that their po announced policy to pay for travel for Um, well, I'll defer to Beth on right to travel constitutional issues because she's really the constitutional lawyer here, and, and I'm not going to comment on any pending or threatened claims. Um, I would say that the, um, I, I really don't want to comment on the letter either. I mean, I, I would say that the Congressional Freedom Caucus is maybe, I don't know, eight legislators or something. It's not, I mean, that, that label gets thrown around and it, just to be clear, it's not the entire legislature of, legislature of the state of Texas. Um, we do keep getting into areas where I think incrementally the federal government and the current administration is weighing in. There were also, um, just to put out there, um, questions about whether or not um, certain employee benefits were discriminatory. And a former EEOC commissioner, for example, said that um, providing certain benefits could discriminate on the basis of um, religion or disability. And then the EEOC came back out and you know made a, a statement. There is a um, charger, I, I guess, complaint that's being looked at into that. So it's still very much evolving, I would say. And that's why I do think that statement, and it's a concurring opinion, and yet it was so significant because it did put a marker down. You know one vote, and it, it's one vote that you would have wondered about. So I think that's important to know. But also when you look at something that that letter suggests that aiding and betting would be, is it aiding and betting for conduct that's outside the state? 
or is it aiding and abetting conduct within the state? And what makes it unlawful in the state if it's law, it's aiding something that's lawful where it occurs? So there are a lot of those kinds of, you know, they're, they're old criminal law cases that would be law school exams. You know, somebody, you know, commits a crime here that carries over the border into the other state. So I think there's a lot of um, areas to be developed there, but really even what it means to be extraterritorial and, um, you know, what authority the state has with even its own state if the conduct is related to something that's lawful in another state. But that's why you should watch the pork case. <laughs> well, if I can just add really quickly, I know we're out of time. Um, but that's, the, that's one of the things that's interesting about the development of shield laws is that they have to, obviously, they have to, number one, they have to be very carefully written, mm -hmm. right, to, to delineate what's the conduct that's lawful in the state, right? In Massachusetts, there's a definition for um, ab abusive litigation, right, which is out-of-state litigation and what's protected in terms of the um, uh, in-state conduct uh, which is uh, uh, protected, protected reproductive health or, or something like that um, in the statute that is protected by Massachusetts if it's done anywhere in the country, right? And so this is completely untested, yeah. right, in any court. And how those laws are going to be challenged is going to be an interesting thing to watch. Well, another thing that's interesting about it is these, these laws bring up full faith and credit, that, you know, cases and case law that is from the 1850s. Hmm. And so, you know, the last time we wrestled so much with those, you know, it, it led to some pretty disastrous, uh, you know, conse consequences for our country. And, and the fact that we're in this moment where we're looking back to case law from that moment um, says something. And I'll just also point people back to on the web page for this conference, we do have a suggested reading list. And I'll recommend to you uh, Dean Rabuchet's The New Abortion Battleground, where they really try to struggle with a lot of these complex problems. And, and basically, you know, I, I've heard several people say, if anybody tries to tell you they know what the answers are to these questions right now, they are just making it up. They, because they don't. No one knows. And uncertainty is the hallmark of this era uncertainty, ambiguity, what in the heck, which brings us back to risk analysis, and how do we deal with this in the practical everyday world of trying to live our lives and get from point A to point B. Uh, so thank you all for coming. I'm so excited that everyone was here to hear these wonderful panelists, and thank you, panelists. What a, what a great conversation. Thank you so much.